There is indeed a patience as we wait for a new morn. Welcome to our 2020 carol service. This is one of the highlights of the year for me. And whilst it's sad that we cannot come together in our beautiful chapel this evening, I am delighted that you have chosen to join us remotely. We cannot enjoy each other's company, but we can still enjoy wonderful readings and glorious music. We're very fortunate that our readings will have a touch of stardust thanks to the extraordinary Sir Simon Russell Beale and two stellar summer villains, Ella Rode and Matt Maltby. Christmas and magic go hand in hand, whether you're a child looking out of the window for Father Christmas or a worshipper, or perhaps just someone anticipating time with your family. It's always good to see such a diverse choice of music as part of the chapel's outlook and the four choral pieces that you'll hear this evening are a testament to that and so very appropriate to Somerville. Christmas will be very different for many of us this year, unable to celebrate with family and friends as it was for Eid and Diwali and it will be for Hanukkah. This will be a matter of sadness, but we will gain strength from our community as well as joy from the memories of Christmas past and our anticipation of the future when we can once again be together. This wretched pandemic has presented most of us with the greatest challenges that we have ever faced. I know that for many people it's been extremely tough, with periods of great anxiety and loneliness, but the resilience of our Somervillians has been extraordinary, with their capacity to make the best of the most difficult circumstances. From the indefatigable 93-year-old Professor Lalaji Bone, to our current students who have been amazing throughout a hugely demanding term, studying hard whilst playing their part in keeping our college safe for the whole of our community, including our academic and non-academic staff, who, being older, are often more vulnerable. But at last we now have hope, and we should all be proud of our colleagues who have identified treatments for those with COVID-19 and especially those who've done the groundbreaking research to develop the vaccine, which will be transformative, not just for the citizens of this country, but for people throughout the world in developing as well as in developed countries. They have done what Oxford does best, brilliant research, which is then used for the public good. After Christmas, our thoughts turn to the new year, a time when we dare to dream and a hope of better times for ourselves, for our loved ones and for our society. I know that the next few months will continue to be challenging, but change will come. In last week's beautiful recording of The Upside, which I commend to you all, Professor Bone cited a quotation by the great Oxfordian William Morris. Ill would change be at whiles were it not for the change beyond that change. The vaccine will bring about a desperately needed change in our world and our students, nurtured by their education and rooted in our values, will help to transform the world beyond that change. This evening, however, is not a time for change. It's a time to delight in tradition and to wrap ourselves in the comfort of familiarity. We have a rare treat of readings from the most distinguished actors, as well as music from our marvellous choir and organists, and the opportunity to join carols which we know and love. The first of which is O Little Town of Bethlehem.
Amazing Peace, a Christmas poem by Maya Angelou. Thunder rumbles in the mountain passes, and lightning rattles the eaves of our houses. Floodwaters await us in our avenues. Snow falls upon snow, falls upon snow to avalanche over unprotected villages. The sky slips low and grey and threatening. We question ourselves. What have we done to so affront nature? We worry God. Are you there? Are you there, really? Does the covenant you made with us still hold? Into this climate of fear and apprehension, Christmas enters. The world is encouraged to come away from rancour, come the way of friendship. It is the glad season. Thunder ebbs to silence and lightning sleeps quietly in the corner. Floodwaters recede into memory. Snow becomes a yielding cushion to aid us as we make our way to higher ground. Hope is born again in the faces of children. It rides on the shoulders of our aged as they walk into their sunsets. In our joy, we think we hear a whisper. At first it is too soft, then only half heard. We listen carefully as it gathers strength. We hear a sweetness. The word is peace. It is loud now. It is louder. Louder than bombs. We tremble at the sound. We are thrilled by its presence. It is what we have hungered for. Not just the absence of war, but true peace. A harmony of spirit. A comfort of courtesies. Security for our beloveds and their beloveds. We clap hands and welcome peace. We beckon this good season to wait a while with us. We, Baptist and Buddhist, Methodist and Muslim, say, come, peace. Come and fill us and our world with your majesty. We, the Jew and the Jainist, the Catholic and the Confucian, implore you to stay a while with us, so we may learn by your shimmering light how to look beyond complexion and see community. It is Christmas time a halting of hate time. On this platform of peace, we can create a language to translate ourselves to ourselves and to each other. We shout with glorious tongues at the coming of hope. All the Earth's tribes loosen their voices to celebrate the promise of peace. We, angels and mortals, Believers and non-believers look heavenward and speak the word aloud. Peace. We look at our world and speak the word aloud. Peace. We look at each other, then into ourselves, and we say without shyness or apology or hesitation, Peace, my brother. Peace, my sister. Peace, my soul.
Christmas by John Betjeman. The bells of waiting advent ring, the tortoise stove is lit again, and lamp oil light across the night has caught the streaks of winter rain. In many a stained glass window sheen from crimson lake to hooker's green. The holly in the windy hedge and round the manor house the yew will soon be stripped to deck the ledge, the altar, font, and arch and pew, so that the villagers can say, the church looks nice on Christmas day. Provincial public houses blaze and corporation tram cars clang. On lighted tenements I gaze where paper decorations hang and bunting in the red town hall says, Merry Christmas to you all. And London shops on Christmas Eve are strung with silver bells and flowers as hurrying clerks the city leave to pigeon-haunted classic towers, and marble clouds go scudding by the many-steepled London sky. And girls in slacks remember Dad, and oafish louts remember Mum, and sleepless children's hearts are glad, and Christmas morning bells say come, even to shining ones who dwell safe in the Dorchester Hotel. And is it true and is it true, this most tremendous tale of all, seen in a stained glass window's hue, a baby in an ox's stall, the maker of the stars and sea become a child on earth for me? And is it true? For if it is, no loving fingers tying strings around those tissued fripperies, the sweet and silly Christmas things, bath salts, an inexpensive scent and hideous tie so kindly meant, no love that in a family dwells, no caroling in frosty air, nor all the steeple-shaking bells can with this single truth compare, that God was man in Palestine and lives today in bread and wine.
Extracts from Winter Hours by Mary Oliver. In the winter I'm writing about, there was much darkness. Darkness of nature, darkness of event, darkness of the spirit. The sprawling darkness of not knowing. We speak of the light of reason, but I speak here of the darkness of the world and the light of... Hmm, but I don't know what to call it. Maybe hope, maybe faith, but not a shaped faith. Only, say, a gesture or a continuum of gestures. But probably it is hoped closer to hope, actually, which is more active and far messier than faith must be. Faith, as I imagine it, is tensile and cool and has no need of words. Hope, I know, is a fighter and a screamer. Because my work day begins early, it begins in winter in the huge, tense blackness of the world. Morning, for me, is the time of best work. My conscious thought sings like a bird in a cage, but the rest of me is singing too like a bird in the wind. Perhaps something is still strong in us in the morning. The part that's untamable, that dreams willfully and crazily, that knows reason is no more than an island within us. I've never been to Rome. I've never been to Paris or Greece or Sweden or India. I once went to the Far East, Japan and Malaysia and New Zealand and Indonesia, and I'm glad I saw the Southern Cross, but I haven't forgotten how it felt to think I was going to fall off the planet. I'm not a traveller. Well, not of that sort. I do know the way to the grocery store, and I can get that far. The simples of our lives. Bread, fruit, vegetables. For years, when the tide was high, I went, early or late, to another part of the world, which is mainly pine woods. In the pine woods is where the owl floats, and where the white egret paces in summer like a winged snake in the flashing shallows. Here is where two deer approach me one morning in an unforgettable sweetness, their faces like light brown flowers, their eyes kindred and full of curiosity. The mouth of one of them and its vibrant tongue touch my hand. This is where the coyotes appeared one season and followed me, bold beyond belief, and nimble, lean ferocities just held in check. And this is where, once, I heard suddenly a powerful beating of wings, a feisty rhythm, a pomp of sound, within it a thrust, then a slight uptake. The wings of angels might sound so, who are, after all, not mild, but militant, and cross the skies on important missions. But then, just above the trees, their feet trailing and eyes ablaze, two swans flew by. I couldn't be a poet without the natural world. Someone else could, but not me. For me, the daughter of the woods is the daughter of the temple. Under the trees, along the pale slopes of sand, I walk in an ascendant relationship to rapture, and with words I celebrate this rapture. Sometimes I think, were I just a little rougher maid, I'd go altogether to the woods, to my work entirely, and solitude. A few friends, books, my dogs, all things peaceful, ready for meditation and industry, if for no other reason than to escape the heart-jamming damages and discouragements of the world's mean spirits. But, no use. Even the most solitudinous of us is communal by habit and indeed by commitment to the bravest of our dreams, which is to make a moral world. The whirlwind of human behaviour is not to be set aside. I'd say there exist a thousand unbreakable links between each of us and everything else, and that our dignity and our chances are one. The farthest star and the mud at our feet are family, and there's no decency or sense in honouring one thing or a few things and then closing the list. The pine tree, the leopard, the river, ourselves, we are at risk together or we're on our way to a sustainable world together. We are each other's destiny.
Thank you, Will, and thank you to the choir. That was beautiful. Sentimental, yes, but I love that song, and it brings back memories from my childhood onwards, a great feeling of warmth. Written in 1943, at a time of uncertainty, fear and anxiety, when many loved ones could not be together, it's no wonder that the words resonate today. The lyrics include, next year all our troubles will be out of sight. Not true in 1943, of course, but hopefully it will be true for us. As well as, someday soon we will all be together if the fates allow. Thankfully, we don't have to rely on the fates because we can, I believe, rely on the transformative power of research, which itself results from a wonderful education, an education enjoyed by all Somervillians, which even in the darkest times is a matter for celebration. I'm constantly amazed by the ability of our choir and all of our college musicians to make music, no matter how challenging the circumstances, and the way in which an evening of music and readings can be stitched together and produced so professionally when we don't have the re requisite equipment. So our thanks must go to Jack, to Andrew, Finn and Dave for weaving together the magic of production. Thanks also to Will, our superb choir director, to the choir, to Melissa and Luca, our organ scholars, to Monty, our chapel director, and also, of course, to Sir Simon Russell Beale, Emma Rode and Matt Maltby for their brilliant readings. I wish that we could gather, as usual, in the Mary Somerville Room for post-carol service mince pies and mulled wine, to share stories of the past and catch up on the present. Friendship and mutual support is always important, but especially in difficult times. For the moment, we'll have to rely on social media, on Teams and on Zoom to bring some civilians together. I hope that next year our carol service will take place in person in this chapel, but I'm determined that then, as now, some civilians from all over the world will be able to join us. I wish you a very happy Christmas and a peaceful and healthy New Year.